Chapter Eleven of the Red and the Black, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. The Red and the Black, Volume One by Stondal. Translated by Horace B. Samuel. Chapter Eleven. An evening. Yet Julia's very coldness still was kind, and tremulously gently her small hand withdrew itself from his, but left behind a little pressure, thrilling and so bland, and slight, so very slight, that to the mind twas but a doubt. Don Juan. Chapter One, Stanza Seventy One. It was necessary, however, to put in an appearance at Verrieres. As Julien left the curé house, he was fortunate enough to meet M. Valneau, whom he hastened to tell of the increase in his salary. On returning to Vergy, Julien waited till night had fallen, before going down into the garden. His soul was fatigued by the great number of violent emotions which had agitated him during the day. What shall I say to them? He reflected anxiously, as he thought about the ladies. He was far from realising that his soul was just in a mood to discuss those trivial circumstances, which usually monopolise all feminine interests. Julien was often unintelligible to Madame Derville, and even to her friend, and he, in his turn, only half understood all that they said to him. Such was the effect of the force and if I may venture to use such language, the greatness of the transports of passion which overwhelmed the soul of this ambitious youth. In this singular being it was storm nearly every day. As he entered the garden this evening, Julien was inclined to take an interest in what the pretty cousins were thinking. They were waiting for him impatiently. He took his accustomed seat next to Madame de Renal. The darkness soon became profound. He attempted to take hold of a white hand which he had seen some time near him, as it leant on the back of a chair. Some hesitation was shewn, but eventually the hand was withdrawn, in a manner which indicated displeasure. Julien was inclined to give up the attempt, as a bad job, and to continue his conversation quite gaily, when he heard M. de Renal approaching. The coarse words he had uttered in the morning were still ringing in Julien's ears. Would not taking possession of his wife's hand in his very presence, he said to himself, be a good way of scoring off that creature who has all that life can give him? Yes, I will do it. I, the very man for whom he has evidenced so great a contempt. From that moment the tranquillity which was so alien to Julien's real character, quickly disappeared. He was obsessed by an anxious desire that Madame de Renal should abandon her hand to him. Monsieur de Renal was talking politics with vehemence. Two or three commercial men in Verrieres had been growing distinctly richer than he was, and were going to annoy him over the elections. Madame Derville was listening to him. Irritated by these tirades, Julien brought his chair nearer Madame de Renal. All his movements were concealed by the darkness. He dared to put his hand very near to the pretty arm which was left uncovered by the dress. He was troubled and had lost control of his mind. He brought his face near to that pretty arm and dared to put his lips on it. Madame de Renal shuddered. Her husband was four paces away. She hastened to give her hand to Julien and at the same time to push him back a little. As M. de Renal was continuing his insults against those ne'er-do-wells and Jacobins who were growing so rich, Julien covered the hand which had been abandoned to him with kisses, which were either really passionate, or at any rate seemed so, to Madame de Renal. But the poor woman had already had the proofs, on that same fatal day, that the man whom she adored, without owning it to herself, loved another. During the whole time Julien had been absent, she had been the prey to an extreme unhappiness, 
which had made her reflect. What, she said to herself, am I going to love? Am I going to be in love? Am I, a married woman, going to fall in love? But, she said to herself, I have never felt, for my husband, this dark madness, which never permits of my keeping Julien out of my thoughts. After all, he is only a child, who is full of respect for me. This madness will be fleeting. In what way do the sentiments which I may have for this young man concern my husband? M. de Renal would be bored by the conversations which I have with Julien on imaginative subjects. As for him, he simply thinks of his business. I am not taking anything away from him to give to Julien. No hypocrisy had sullied the purity of that naive soul, now swept away by a passion such as it had never felt before. She deceived herself, but without knowing it. But none the less, a certain instinct of virtue was alarmed. Such were the combats which were agitating her, when Julien appeared in the garden. She heard him speak, and almost at the same moment she saw him sit down by her side. Her soul was, as it were, transported by this charming happiness, which had for the last fortnight surprised her even more than it had allured. Everything was novel for her. None the less, she said to herself after some moments, the mere presence of Julien is quite enough to blot out all his wrongs. She was frightened. It was then that she took away her hand. His passionate kisses, the like of which she had never received before, made her forget that perhaps he loved another woman. Soon he was no longer guilty in her eyes. The cessation of that poignant pain, which suspicion had engendered, and the presence of a happiness that she had never even dreamt of, gave her ecstasies of love and of mad gaiety. The evening was charming for every one, except the mayor of Verrières, who was unable to forget his parvenu manufacturers. Julien left off thinking about his black ambition, or about those plans of his, which were so difficult to accomplish. For the first time in his life, he was led away by the power of beauty, lost in a sweetly vague reverie, quite alien to his character, and softly pressing that hand, which he thought ideally pretty, he half listened to the rustle of the leaves of the pine-trees, swept by the light night breeze, and to the dogs of the mill on the doube, who barked in the distance. But this emotion was one of pleasure and not passion. As he entered his room, he only thought of one happiness, that of taking up again his favourite book. When one is twenty, the idea of the world, and the figure to be cut in it, dominate everything. He soon, however, laid down the book. As the result of thinking of the victories of Napoleon, he had seen a new element in his own victory. Yes, he said to himself, I have won a battle. I must exploit it. I must crush the pride of that proud gentleman while he is in retreat. That would be real Napoleon. I must ask him for three days' holiday, to go and see my friend Fouquet. If he refuses me, I will threaten to give him notice. But he will yield the point. Madame de Renal could not sleep a wink. It seemed as though, until this moment, she had never lived. She was unable to distract her thoughts from the happiness of feeling Julien cover her hand with his burning kisses. Suddenly the awful word adultery came into her mind. All the loathsomeness with which the vilest debauchery can invest sensual love presented itself to her imagination. These ideas essayed to pollute the divinely tender image which she was fashioning of Julien, and of the happiness of loving him. The future began to be painted in terrible colours. She began to regard herself as contemptible. That moment was awful. Her soul was arriving in unknown countries. During the evening she had tasted a novel happiness. Now she found herself suddenly plunged in an atrocious unhappiness. She had never had any idea of such sufferings. They troubled her reason. She thought for a moment of confessing to her husband that she was apprehensive of loving Julien. It would be an opportunity of speaking of him. Fortunately, her memory threw up a maxim which her aunt had once given her on the eve of her marriage. 
the maxim dealt with the danger of making confidences to a husband for a husband is after all a master she wrung her hands in the excess of her grief she was driven this way and that by clashing and painful ideas at one moment she feared that she was not loved the next the awful idea of crime tortured her as much as if she had to be exposed in the pillory on the following day in the public square of verrieres with a placard to explain her adultery to the populace madame de renal had no experience of life even in the full possession of her faculties and when fully exercising her reason she would never have appreciated any distinction between being guilty in the eyes of god and finding herself publicly overwhelmed with the crudest marks of universal contempt when the awful idea of adultery and of all the disgrace which in her view that crime brought in its train left her some rest she began to dream of the sweetness of living innocently with julien as in the days that had gone by she found herself confronted with the horrible idea that julien loved another woman she still saw his pallor when he had feared to lose her portrait or to compromise her by exposing it to view for the first time she had caught fear on that tranquil and noble visage he had never shewn such emotion to her or her children this additional anguish reached the maximum of unhappiness which the human soul is capable of enduring unconsciously madame de renal uttered cries which woke up her maid suddenly she saw the brightness of a light appear near her bed and recognized elisa is it you he loves she exclaimed in her delirium fortunately the maid was so astonished by the terrible trouble in which she found her mistress that she paid no attention to this singular expression madame de renal appreciated her imprudence i have a fever she said to her and i think i am a little delirious completely woken up by the necessity of controlling herself she became less unhappy reason regained that supreme control which the semi-somnolent state had taken away to free herself from her maid's continual stare she ordered her maid to read the paper and it was as she listened to the monotonous voice of this girl reading a long article from the quotidienne that madame de renal made the virtuous resolution to treat julien with absolute coldness when she saw him again End of chapter 11